David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, what day is it? I don't know. Far be it for me to tell you what day it is. Uh, I haven't decided still what days we'll get which of these short podcasts, and it doesn't really matter. So you uh, you check into whatever date it is you think it is where you live, and uh, who knows? You could be listening to this later on as a podcast anyway. Why should I presume? to tell you what date, certainly not to, what date to listen to it on. All right. Anyway, uh, I've got another piece for you here, something that I thought it would be interesting to share with you, taking a look at uh, the various excerpts from the various Trump books that are coming out these days. There are dozens of them, I think dozens of books, and certainly dozens of excerpts from each one. We've uh, dabbled in a few. Some have created stories of their own. Some have, uh, some have not, I guess. Some feel like things we knew already. But this one here, I thought, uh, I thought uh, offered some possibilities for some interesting insights. So anyway, I'll roll that one out. We'll take a look at that and catch up with a few other items in the days to come. Hope you enjoy what we have to present. And now we cut away, uh, not live, I guess, to my thoughts on the subject previously recorded well maybe vacation is a great time to get caught up on the various excerpts from trump books that are available to us rather than spend any of our time reading those books even on the beach uh, i don't think i could bother myself with that but excerpts that's fun bite-sized way of absorbing all of this nonsense this i think not an excerpt from the book so much as a backstory on the production of the book, Carol Leonig and Philip Rucker writing in uh, Vanity Fair about an interview of Trump that he sat down for two months after leaving the White House at Pervalago, which might be of some interest to everybody here and uh, give us some insight into, uh, I don't know, what, uh, what a lunatic he is and how astonished they were at his lunacy when they were preparing the book. So the piece here is titled, I'm getting the word out. That's like a quote from Trump. I'm getting the word out inside the feverish mind of Donald Trump two months after leaving the White House. Okay, let's take a look. Seventy days had passed since Donald Trump left Washington against his will. On March 1st, 2021, we ventured to Mar-a-Lago, where he still reigned as king of Republican politics. We arrived late that afternoon for our audience with the man who used to be president, and we were ushered into an ornate 60-foot-long room that functioned as a kind of lobby leading to the club's patio. A model of Air Force One, painted in Trump's proposed redesign, a flat red stripe across the middle, a navy belly, a white top, and a giant American flag on the tail was proudly displayed on the coffee table facing the entrance. I don't know whether that's a model that he was entitled to take with him, but it's there, and I guess the uh, GAO can tell us whether or not that's something he needs to return. Somebody check into that. Thanks. It was a prop disconnected from reality. Trump's vision never, never came to be. The fleet, now in use by President Biden, still bears the iconic baby blue and white livery designed by Jacqueline Kennedy. Used to be is not a phrase anyone dares use to describe the president inside his Palm Beach castle. Here, beneath the gold leaf ceiling of winged griffins and crystal chandeliers, Trump still rules, surrounded day and night by applauding fans, obsequious courtiers, and dutiful servants. At the perfectly manicured Mar-a-Lago, none of the disgrace that marked the end of his presidency pierces Trump's reality. Here, he and his aides work to maintain the gospel according to Trump, with the most important revelations being that Donald Trump was the greatest president of all time and was unjustly denied a second term. 
Trump had invited us to Mar-a-Lago to interview him for this book. He had declined an interview for our first book about his presidency, and when A Very Stable Genius was published in January 2020, attacked us personally and branded our reporting a work of fiction. But Trump was quick to agree to our request this time. He sought to curate history. As we sat for the interview, the former president's press secretary presented us copies of a bound volume, 1,000 Accomplishments of President Donald J. Trump, highlights of the first term, the first term. On the back cover is an American flag, the presidential seal, and Trump's thick, jagged signature. The book totals 92 pages and is organized with chapters dedicated to the economy, tax cuts, deregulation, trade, and so on. Trump walked into the room flanked by a couple of plain-clothed Secret Service agents, a much smaller detail than he once had as president. He wore his customary dark suit and tie, his face covered with bronze makeup. Thank you for pointing that out. He sat in his preferred position, a plush armchair of ivory brocade facing the entrance hmm, where guests arrive, with us on a sofa to his right. Behind him was a huge window looking out to the Atlantic Ocean. In front of him, the patio facing Lake Worth. And I guess it's important to know that it's a huge window because, he goes on to say, this is the biggest, the best, the most acreage, the most everything, the ocean, the lake. It fronts both, the ever-boasting Trump said. Mar-a-Lago is ocean to lake. Did you know that? Very few people know that. They don't know what Mar means or Lago. Hmm. Very few people know that, I guess. Did you know that? Mar-a-Lago, ocean to lake. It's the only place. See that window? That window, when that was built, is the largest pane of glass in the world. Okay? I love the okays. And okay? You know, do you acknowledge me? Yeah, sure. All right. Biggest pane of glass. Who the F cares? Wow. I mean, you know. I guess it's nice to know what was once the largest pane of glass. But it's not very nice to know. It's just, I don't know, it looks like glass to me. Did you know it was the largest pane of glass in the world at the time? No, I didn't. Past the salt, you know. Uh, anyway, so that's big news for him. Trump started the interview by pointing out his en enduring and unrivaled power within the Republican Party. He explained that he didn't intend to follow the path of former presidents who largely bowed out of the nitty-gritty of party politics. He was proud to say he genuinely enjoys this sport he found so late in life and believes he plays it better than anyone else, of course. The parade of Republican politicians flocking to Mar-a-Lago all spring to kiss his ring had both energized him, he said, and proved the value of his stock. We've had so many. And so many are coming in, Trump said. It's been pretty amazing. You see the numbers. They need the endorsement. I don't say this in a braggadocious way. I'm amazed he can say that word. But if they don't get the endorsement, they don't win. But future elections were not front and center in his mind. A past election was. What do you know? Trump was fixated on his loss in 2020. Didn't he endorse himself? That's weird. Returning to this wound repeatedly throughout the interview, because, duh, of course. In a certain way, I had two presidencies, he said. <laughs> In the first, when the economy was roaring, Trump argued, oh, I'm sorry, this isn't a quote. I thought he was talking about himself. But Trump, Trump argued that he had been unbeatable, never mind that his approval rating was never higher than 46% in the Gallup poll during his first three years as president, I think it would be hard if George Washington came back from the dead and he chose Abraham Lincoln as his vice president. I think it would have been very hard for them to beat me, Trump said. Then, he lamented, came his second presidency. The pandemic killed his chances. Of course, you know, pandemic was what it was because he's a moron, but okay. Trump seemed determined as well to convince us that he actually had won. And handily, had it not been for the many people who had wronged him, the evil people, 
who conspired to deny him his rightful second term. The greatest fraud ever perpetrated in this country was the last election, Trump said. It was rigged and it was stolen. It was both. <laughs> I like that. It was rigolin. He didn't bother trying to say that. But it was rigged and stolen. It was both. It was a combination. And Bill Barr didn't do anything about it. It was his fault, really. Trump faulted not only his attorney general, but Vice President Pence for lacking the bravery to do what was right, and of course was illegal. Had Mike Pence had the courage to send it back to the legislatures, you would have had a different outcome, in my opinion, Trump said. That's, I mean, whatever. That's just very Trumpy. I like that. He hedges, in my opinion, anyway. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. What do I know, right? He's... Maybe yes, maybe no. But let's let's get people killed over it. Just... I think that the vice president of the United States must protect the Constitution of the United States, he added. I don't believe he's just supposed to be a statue who gets these votes from the states and immediately hands them over, except that's what the law says. If you see fraud, which he didn't, then I believe you have an obligation to do one of a number of things. Oh, really? Really, really. One of a number of things. I think that uh, you do have that obligation. One of the obligations, one of those things is drink a tall, cool glass of grape juice. But that doesn't, that one doesn't help me very much. I wanted the one where he reverses the election. But he's clearly obligated to do, those are just two of many things he's obligated to do. And uh, I was hoping for the second one where he reverses the election. But do you know that he didn't even drink the grape juice? He probably didn't know that. Many people don't know that. The irony was lost on Trump, however, that one of the central reasons he had prized Pence as his number two, and he really was his number two, was his resemblance to a statue standing adoringly at his side. Trump then invoked the non-analogous example he had latched onto. Thomas Jefferson was in the exact same position. But only one state, the state of Georgia. Did you know that? It's true. Hear ye, hear ye. I don't know what he's doing. That's what it says. Hear ye, hear ye. was much more elegant in those days. He was, hear ye, hear ye. The great state of Georgia is unable to accurately count its votes, Thomas Jefferson said. Are you sure? They said, yes, we are sure. Then we will take the votes from the great state of Georgia. And he took them for him and the president. I don't know what the F he's talking about. Trump, I mean, I know that he had a contested election, but I don't, I don't think it went down anything like this. Trump continued. So I said, Mike, you can be Thomas Jefferson or you can be Mike Pence. Well, he, he is Mike Pence. What happened is I had a very good relationship with Mike, Mike Pence. Very good. But when you are handed these votes, and before you even start about the individual corruptions, the people, the this, the that, the, all the different things that took place, when you are handed these votes right there, you should have sent them back to the legislatures. Why? Because peanut butter, jelly, grape juice, boom, it's done. Thomas Jefferson. I don't know. He didn't say that, but I, he might as well have said it at this point. Later in the conversation... Trump again expressed his disappointment in Pence. What courage would have, well, what is it? What courage would have been, there we go, is to do what Thomas Jefferson did and, and said, we're taking the votes, he said. That would have been politically unacceptable. But sending it back to these legislators, that's interesting. So what courage would have been to do the unacceptable thing? We're taking the votes. They say Biden we're taking them for Trump. That would have been courage in his view. But, okay, if you don't have courage, then send them back to the legislators. And I could show you letters from legislators, big scale letters from different states. What? Major, major states. Big letters, long, with signatures on them, many of them. All right, well, whatever, okay. Uh, that would have been politically unacceptable. Sending it back to the legislatures who now know that bad things happened would have been very acceptable. There you go. And I could show you letters from legislators, big scale letters from different states, the states we're talking about. Had he done that, I think it would have been a great thing for our country. But 
he surmised, I think he had bad advice. Trump argued that he stands apart from the presidents before him by the loyalty and intensity of his supporters. You see, different. Don't need laws. He's different. There's never been a base that screams out with 35,000 people. We love you. We love you, he said. That never happened to Ronald Reagan. It never happened to anybody. We have a base like no other. They're very angry. We love you. We love you. So angry. So angry. That's what happened in Washington on the 6th. They went down because of the election fraud. The one thing that nobody says is how many people were there. Because if you look at that real crowd, that crowd for the speech, I bet you it was over a million people. It, it was not. It was not even close. That was Trump's goal. Or rather, what was Trump's goal? Oh, okay. What was Trump's goal on January 6th? Okay, that is a good question. Uh, what did he hope his supporters would do after he told them to march on the Capitol? He chose to remark again on the size of the crowd. You know, what the hell were you trying to accomplish there? Basically, you know, confess your crimes. Right? Well, I would venture to say that it was the largest crowd I had ever spoken to before, Trump said. It was a loving crowd, too, by the way. There was a lot of love. I've heard that from everybody. Many, many people have told me that was a loving crowd. It was too bad. It was too bad that they did that. I don't know what happened to the love, I guess. Apparently, this is good. just dissipated. Pressed again, Trump said he had hoped his supporters would simply, or didn't say simply, would show up outside the Capitol, but not enter the building. In all fairness, the Capitol Police were ushering people in. That's, that's all the fairness right there. They were ushering people in, Trump said. The Capitol Police were very friendly. They were hugging and kissing you don't see that. There's plenty of tape on that. Haven't found it yet, but it's it's there. Trump didn't mention the countless accounts of horrific violence, that of a riotous mob shoving a police officer to the ground, later threatening to shoot him with his own gun, or of that of an insurrectionist bashing a flagpole into another police officer's chest, or that of yet another officer howling in pain as he was compressed in a closing door. Personally, what I wanted is what they wanted, Trump said to the rioters. They showed up just to show support because I happen to believe the election was rigged at a level like nothing has ever been rigged before. I mean, honest to God, sometimes listening to him say these things, the same phrases over and over, it's just painful. There's tremendous proof. There's tremendous proof. Statistically, it wasn't even possible that Biden won. This... Things such as if you win Florida and Ohio and Iowa, there's never been a loss. I mean, there's 50 states. You could just combine them differently. It's just the way it is. I love the fact that he says it twice, though. There's tremendous proof. There's tremendous proof. And I'm imagining that that's exactly how he says it, too. But I don't know. I don't have a recording. He was referring to conventional wisdom that... Historically, the winner of the presidential election has carried that same trio of states that Trump won. This was one of the traits that had led Trump to the White House on full display. That is, his extraordinary capacity to say things that were not true. He always seemed to have complete conviction in whatever product he was selling or argument he was making. He had an uncanny ability to say with a straight face things that are not uh, as you've been told or even as you've seen with your own eyes. He could commit to a lie in the frame of his body and in the timbre of his voice so fully, despite all statistical and even video evidence to the contrary. At various points in our interview, Trump presented other examples of what he called proof the election had been stolen from him. I love when he does these things, except I actually hate this. Take all of the dead people that voted, and there were thousands of them, by the way. We have lists of obituaries, Trump argued. If you take the illegal immigrants that voted, wait, what happened to the dead people? If you take the illegal immigrants that voted, if you take this Indians that got paid to vote in different places, 
We had Indians getting paid to vote. Many, many different things. All election changing. I don't know what he's talking about. I don't even know what kind of Indians he means. No idea. Trump zeroed in on large cities in Michigan and Pennsylvania, both of which he lost to Biden, that are home to many black people. Hmm. And historically, vote heavily Democratic. Look, everyone knows that Detroit was so corrupt. Everyone knows that they literally beat up people there. They hurt people to get the vote watchers out. Our vote watchers, Republican vote watchers, he said. He added, Philadelphia, highly corrupt in terms of elections. There were tremendous irregularities that went on there, including the fact that you had more votes than you had voters. He was still fixated on the debunked water main conspiracy in Fulton County, Georgia. I don't even know if I know this one. They say, water main break, everyone leaves, everyone leaves. And then you have these people go in with two or three other people, all their people run to a table where the ballots are. This table, which had a skirt on it, opened the skirt. I thought he kind of liked that, maybe that part, but and took out the ballots and started stuffing the ballot boxes, he said. It was reported on every newscast. It was reported that Rudy Giuliani, crazy a-hole that he is, was pointing at it saying, look, look, they're stealing the ballots. And then it was debunked on the same television newscasts. But, you know, whatever. Uh, there's just no getting through to this guy. In his discussion of the stolen election, Trump grew more animated and specific about the long list of advisors and allies he considered disloyal. He said that Barr failed him as attorney general for not buying the conspiracy and for not dispatching the FBI to investigate Fulton County's vote tallying process or Kavanaugh, but whatever. To Trump's mind, Barr had become too exhausted to act in his final months on the job. Trump also posited that Barr had grown too sensitive to media criticism, worried about his depiction as a loyal marionette who did the president's bidding. That won't change that he backed away from properly investigating voter fraud. Bill Barr changed a lot, Trump said. He changed drastically, and in my opinion, he changed because of the media. The media is brilliant. I give him credit. I get it better than anybody that's ever lived. Bill Barr came in because he was really legitimately incensed at what they were doing to me and the presidency on the Mueller hoax. He did a good job on the Russian hoax, okay? Right? Then, as time went by, and what I should have done is said, Bill, thank you very much. Great job. That Don't complete any thoughts or anything. And then, as time went by, and what I should have done is said, thank you very much. Great job. The Department of Justice, he continued, is loaded up with radical left Radical left what? Just, I don't know, radical left. And Bill Barr was being portrayed as a puppet of mine. They said, he's my personal lawyer. He'll, he'll do anything. And I said, here we go. And he got more and more difficult. And I knew it. You know why? Because he's a human being. Because that's the way it works. Trump listed Barr's sins. He didn't, cha he didn't charge James Comey or Andrew McCabe. He didn't announce an investigation into Hunter Biden, and he didn't bring an end to John Durham's probe of the origins of the Russia investigation before the election. By the way, I guess he's still not done, so what are we at, like, how many months? Still going, I guess? No end. I mean, he's not going to find anything, but, but I don't know what to tell you. Trump speculated that Barr was motivated by personal pique rather than reality when he announced on December 1st that the Justice Department had uncovered no evidence of widespread voter fraud that could change the election outcome. I'm not certain what the peak was, but there you have it. Barr disliked me at the end. I guess that's it, in my opinion. And that's why he made the statement about the election, because he did not know, Trump said. And I like Bill Barr, just so you know. I think he started off as a great patriot, but I don't believe he finished that way. Yeah, that's not my fault. Right? I like Bill Barr. He doesn't like me. I don't know what. He just stopped liking me. And then, therefore, he said, I don't like him. So the election, boom, out the window. That's in my opinion. I mean, in my opinion is what I'm saying. It's just an opinion.
Trump said he was also disappointed by federal judges, especially three conservative justices he had nominated to the Supreme Court for ruling against his campaign in the scores of lawsuits it filed, or, in the case of the high court, declining to take the case. When we asked whether he needed better lawyers, considering so many courts had ruled that there was not substantial evidence of fraud, nor merit to the cases brought before them, Trump said his legal team was not to blame. I needed better judges. The Supreme Court was afraid to take it. Trump said, suggesting that justices might have declined to intervene in the election out of fear of stoking violence. Referring to the election result, Trump added, it should have been reversed by the Supreme Court. I'm very disappointed in the Supreme Court because they did a very bad thing for the country. Trump singled out Justice Brett Kavanaugh, suggesting that he should have tried to intervene, or I guess the Kavanaugh should have tried to intervene in the election as payback for the president standing by his nomination in 2018 in the face of sexual assault allegations. I'm very disappointed in Kavanaugh, he said, which is basically like confessing a, a crime against the Constitution, as I think you well know. Trump's chagrin was evident in many of his answers. He emphasized his feelings of victimhood. I have two jobs, running our country and running it well, and survival. Running a well is not the second job. It's the description of the first job, I guess I would say, uh, by way of explaining that, but without leaving the Trump voice. I had two jobs, running our country and running it well, and survival, Trump said. I had the Mueller hoax. I had the witch hunt. It's one big witch hunt that's gone on from the day I came down the escalator a reference to his 2015 campaign launch event in the lobby of New York's Trump Tower. No one's ever gone through what I have, Trump added. They got me on all phony stuff. They killed a couple presidents, but, you know, no one's been treated worse. Trump found fault with most of his fellow Republican leaders, past and present, still clearly vexed by the ghost of the late Arizona Senator John McCain. Trump without prompting, brought up the party's 2008 presidential nominee, whom he had attacked for years. John McCain was a bad guy, he said, of the decorated prisoner of war. He was a bully and a nasty guy. Bad guy. A lot of people disliked him. Last in his class at Annapolis. All that stuff, but he was a bad guy. I say it to you. I don't care. Does it affect me? I won Arizona, okay? By a lot. Didn't turn out that way in terms of the vote, but I won Arizona. Everybody knows it. It didn't affect me. I won the first time. I won it the second time. Isn't that remarkable? Like, I love that. It didn't affect me to attack McCain because I won Arizona. Well, in fact, you lost Arizona. Everybody knows I actually won, though. Well, you know, yeah, the, the vote count says that you actually lost. Well, I didn't. I, I won it the first time. I won it the second time. The second time, the vote count was corrupt. I... I did what I did, now I'm imagining things here for you, but I did what I did with John McCain. I was right. I was right to do it. People said, it's going to cost you. He's very popular in Arizona. It's going to cost you. You might lose the election in Arizona. Well, I didn't, did I? Well, you did. Yeah, you, you did. But, I understand that, but, but I didn't, right? No, you did. I mean... Joe Biden got more votes than you in Arizona. I, I know that you think that, but you don't really think that, do you? I, I got, in reality, I know. I mean, really, really I won. So, like I said, I was completely right about John McCain. People said he's very popular. There's going to be backlash against you. You might lose Arizona. I promised you I wouldn't, and then I didn't. Okay, right. I mean, you did, but... I see what you're saying. Okay. Trump, who in fact lost Arizona to Biden, continued with this fix. You know, I did three rallies in Arizona, he said. I never had an empty seat. Governor Doug Ducey, who withstood Trump's pressure to overturn the result, was not a loyal party member, according to the former president. I think Ducey is a terrible Republican, he said. Ducey did everything he could to block voter integrity, to block people from making sure the vote was accurate. 
Trump also complained about former House Speaker Paul Ryan, why, whom he labeled a super rhino, Republican in name only, you know about rhinos, and he said Mitch McConnell has no personality nor a killer political instinct. He faulted McConnell for refusing to eliminate the filibuster to ram through Republican legislation and for not persuading Senator Joe Manchin, a moderate Democrat from West Virginia, to switch parties. He's a stupid person, Trump said of McConnell. I don't think he's smart enough. I tried to convince Mitch McConnell to get rid of the filibuster, to terminate it so that we would get everything. And he was a knucklehead, and he didn't do it, Trump said. Okay, that sounds familiar. Trump said he wished he had partners in Congress like Meade Esposito, who was the head of the Democratic Party machine in Brooklyn from the late 1960s to the early 1980s. We heard about this part, right? Esposito was close to Trump and his late father, Fred Trump, was known for his patronage and commanded respect. Nobody would ever talk back to Meade Esposito. Meade Esposito didn't have a rhino like a Mitt Romney, you know, because, well, he didn't care about Republicans. He was a Democrat, but okay. Uh, Didn't have a rhino like Mitt Romney, you know, or as I said, Ben Sass, who's lightweight, Trump said, invoking two Republican senators who sometimes criticized him. He added, Mitch McConnell compared to Meet Esposito. It's like a baby compared to a grown-up football player with brains on top of everything else. Amazing, what a... Like a baby and a and a big giant football player. He's big and giant. He's a football player. He's big and giant. He's so big and giant, this football player. And he's got brains, too. He's not one of those dumb football players like, you know, uh, everybody. Except Herschel Walker. Hmm. All right, sure, whatever, man. Uh, Esposito had run a citywide patronage system, they explained, that doled out important jobs to loyalists and people providing gifts and favors. The party boss gained a fearsome reputation for his intimidation tactics and connections to organized crime. Amid an investigation of his work, Esposito retired in 1983. He was convicted of offering a gratuity and interstate travel charges in what? Okay. In 1987. What? Retired in 83. Convicted of offering a gratuity and interstate travel charges? I mean, I don't know, whatever. Okay, in 1987, you could look up what he's convicted of. Other presidents attend to philanthropic interests, write memoirs, and curate presidential libraries after leaving office. But not Trump. No library to speak of, of course. Many of his Palm Beach days have followed the tempo and style he set back in Washington, which is, of course, the tempo and style he had in Mar-a-Lago before he went to Washington. A reflection of his addiction to the 24-hour news cycle and appetite to maintain political relevance. In the morning hours, he spends time alone in his private quarters, watching television and making phone calls to allies and friends. Many days, he plays a round of golf at one of his nearby clubs. Again, like I said, it is, it's not a continuation of his presidency. It's a continuation of everything that came before his presidency. He just didn't interrupt his regular stupid social calendar to take care of the presidency at any point all right well let's see many days he plays rounds of golf and uh in the afternoons he puts on his suit applies his makeup and emerges for meetings with whichever politicians or accolades have made the pilgrimage to mar-a-lago by early 2021 trump had turned his club into a political base camp for his potential comeback trump made no secret of his interest in perhaps running for president in 2024. Would he choose Pence again as his running mate? Well, I was disappointed in Mike, Trump said. But, you know, I'll be making a decision at some point. I will say this. Based on the polls, those polls are great. The Republican Party loves Trump. 97%. When we pointed out that Pence is said to be interested in running for president too, Trump seemed to welcome the competition. It's a free country, right? said it's a free country but trump all but ruled out running with chris christie who had been runner-up to pence in his 2016 veep stakes and nikki haley the former ambassador to the united nations who had criticized trump's attempts to subvert the vote in repeated interviews with tim alberta of politico okay so they're both ruled out 
Chris has been very disloyal. But that's okay. Except it's not. But I love when he does that. It's another one of my favorites. Viz. This person is a vicious murderer. But that's okay. That's okay. I don't mind. All right. Anyway. Chris has been very disloyal. But that's okay. I helped Chris Christie a lot. He knows more than anybody. But I helped him a lot. Oh, what he's really saying is he knows more than anybody. That is to say, not that he knows a lot of things. But he knows more than anybody knows how much I helped him. But I helped him a lot. But he's been disloyal. As for his former ambassador, and remember, you made her ambassador, Trump said he was rebuffing her outreach. Nikki Haley wants to come here so badly, he said. She did a nasty, little nasty couple of statements. She has been killed by the party. When they speak badly about me, the party is not happy about it. It's pretty amazing. There's not been anything like this. Sure, over the years, Trump rarely has expressed misgivings, but he regrets his response to protests last summer in Minneapolis, Portland, Seattle, and other cities. I think if I had it to do over again, I would have brought in the military immediately, he said. Of course. Trump had no such second thoughts about his handling of the pandemic. He said he had been very tough in protecting the country by restricting travel, first from China and then from Europe. He said he did so against the wishes of his top medical advisors. In fact, most of them agreed with the restrictions before he made his decision, according to participants in the discussions and their contemporaneous notes. But he correctly said he pushed scientists at the FDA at a level that they have never been pushed before to get vaccines approved in record time. And by the way, I just read the other day about how uh, vaccine hesitant people, actual hesitancy, not necessarily vaccine opponents, but a lot of the vaccine hesitant say that the reason that they're so hesitant is the speed with which the vaccines were developed, and I was just wondering whether those people blamed Trump and his warp speed program for developing it too fast. But I'm, you know, just wondering. But there you go. I pushed the scientists at a level that they'd never been pushed before. I think we did a great job on COVID, and it hasn't been recognized, Trump said, noting that other countries saw spikes in COVID-19 infections in the months after he left office. The cupboards were bare. We didn't have gowns, we didn't have masks, we didn't have ventilators, we didn't have anything. We brought in plane loads. We did a great job. When we asked Trump why he encouraged people to believe things that weren't true or to distrust science and the media, he delighted in talking about the scientific smarts in his family's genes. First of all, I'm a big person, he said. Do you know this? My uncle, I'm a big person, my uncle, Dr. John Trump, I think he was at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology longer than any other professor. Totally brilliant man. He had numerous degrees. So that's in the genes. Not really. Your uncle. Mm. It's, it's not. His genes went elsewhere. Right? He might have been smart. I guess the idea is, well, he's my uncle, but... He got the smart genes from my grandfather. Now, I'm a babbling idiot. And the best I can do is differentiate between a rhinoceros and a lion and tell you what time a clock says. The other guy, longest serving professor, maybe, maybe not, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, might have had many degrees, totally brilliant. The brains kind of just went to that branch of the family. But, but... I made zero mistakes as to which one was the lion and which one was the camel and which one was the rhinoceros. So I'm just saying a genius would also have made no mistakes. And there you go. Anyway, so that's in the genes. I always go with that stuff. I like that he says so. But it's a little bit in the genes. And Dr. John Trump, he was a great guy. My father's brother. No, I'm a big believer in science. If I wasn't, you wouldn't have a vaccine. It depends. Are you talking about disinformation or are you talking about lies? There is a more beautiful word. That is that what saying? There is a more beautiful word, word called disinformation. Wow. He, has a way he launches at that point. Very few people have heard of it. It's a word that 
I actually coined disinformation. No one has ever used it before. No one, it's a word like you've never seen before because I invented it. Anyway, when we pressed him on whether a president should be, and by the way, what the F does all of that mean? First of all, I'm a big person. Do you know this? Yeah, you're not 239 pounds. I know that. My uncle, professor, brilliant. It's in my genes. Uh, I'm a big believer in science. If I wasn't a big believer in science, you wouldn't have a vaccine. Because if I didn't believe in science, then there wouldn't be any science. Science exists when Donald Trump says it exists, you see. So I don't even know what that means. I'm a big believer in science. If I wasn't, you wouldn't have a vaccine. It depends. Are you talking about disinformation? What? 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 I don't know. And then there's more. Are you talking about disinformation or are you talking about lies? There's a more beautiful word than what? A more beautiful word than disinformation or lies? Yes, it's more beautiful and it's a word called... It's called this. This is what it, that's not what the word is. It's just what it's called, you see. It's called disinformation. All right, I mean, I agree that's a beautiful word, I guess. It really isn't. It's a very ugly word. But I agree, understand that you consider it to be beautiful. How is the word disinformation more beautiful than the word disinformation? You just, I mean, it's the same word that you just said. Are you talking about disinformation or are you talking about lies? There's a more beautiful word called disinformation. All right. When we pressed him on whether a president should be, forget the rest of it. When he pressed him on whether he should be locked up as an imbecile, he said, okay. But when we pressed him on whether a president should be expected to be honest all the time, given his long record of exaggerating successes, downplaying pitfalls, and spreading misinformation, Trump said, I want to be somebody that's optimistic for our country. I think it's very important. Okay, so an on answer. Trump ridiculed Anthony Fauci as a self-promoter and lamented the doctor's popularity. He said the widespread praise for Fauci was undeserved and mocked Fauci's frequent request of people to call him by his first name. A highly overrated person, Trump said. He's a nice guy. I got along great with him. Please call me Tony. I call him. Please, I, don't know, I guess that's what I Please call me Tony. I call him. I mean, you call him Tony. Please call me Tony. So I call him Tony. That, too much, too many words. Please call me Tony, he says twice. He's a great promoter, but he was wrong on everything. Trump also trashed Deborah Burks, who couldn't stop falling all over herself to... Uh, pay fealty to him. But okay, Trump trashed her anyway and said she was far too restrictive. She was a lot of work, a real diva with the scarves and... <laughs> uh, with the scarves and S, the S word, and crap. The, the scarves and... Sh oh my gosh. I mean, I don't know. I kind of want to say it, but, you know, maybe for these special occasions, these special podcasts. She was a lot of work, a real diva with the scarves. He used to compliment the scarves. So now you know what he was thinking at the time. If it were up to her, we wouldn't be meeting tonight. This place, I guess Mar-a-Lago, would be totally closed. You wouldn't have 300 people having dinner outside and schools open. If it were up to her, everything would be closed forever. She's a woman I always liked. But in the end, I jettisoned her. And I didn't take her advice, he said. Adding, she loves publicity almost as much as Fauci. I got some real beauties. Trump, imagine this guy saying this. Trump credited himself with turning government officials into household names, but said it also had a negative consequence. The incredible excitement of his administration, he said, drove media interest in chronicling disputes and differences of opinion among his staff, creating a false impression that his administration was chaotic. Ah, that sounds pretty false, that impression. I don't know. You have a lot of people that have never been stars before. And all of a sudden, the Washington Post is calling. The New York Times is calling. CNN would love to have lunch with you, as everything's measured in lunch for him. But how many miles to uh, from here to the, your golf club? Not so much miles as lunches. How many lunches can I eat between here and there? Come up and meet our editorial staff, 
Trump said. All these people are calling. You're a regular person in government. If you were in the Jimmy Carter administration, you're not calling these people. If you were in the Bush administration, you're not calling these people. And by the way, administration is inserted here. It's in brackets, so I should just read what he actually says. Because, you know, he drops connecting words and all this. You want to hear how he really says it? You're a regular person in government. If you were Jimmy Carter, you're not calling these people. If you were, if you were Bush, right? if you were Jimmy Carter, you're not calling them. If you were Bush, you're not calling these people. With Trump, everybody becomes a star. I'm the greatest star maker in history. Our interview with Trump was scheduled for one hour, but you can see what's happening. Because it's stretched into two and a half. The story is almost going to stretch into two and a half. His press secretary chimed in every 30 minutes to let him know how long we had been speaking and to give him an opening to end it. But Trump seemed to enjoy the conversation and kept talking. Remember when he hated them? They were terrible, right? Clusters of club members traipsed through the room before dinner on the Moorish tiled patio overlooking the lagoon. Service staff gingerly arranged tables around the room's perimeter for the buffet. The interview's going on. Put in the buffet. Go ahead, put it in there. A spread of jumbo gulf shrimp and fresh well-point oysters over ice here. A Bananas Foster station over there. Bananas Foster is the, let me just tell you, the classiest dessert in the world. Some people think it's baked Alaska. I think it's Bananas Foster. Foster, by the way, great guy. And what he did with bananas, unbelievable. Like no bananas you've ever seen before. So very strongly on fire. I don't know what the F you would have to say. but this. Some of Trump's friends breezed past to greet him, interrupting the interview. Laura Ingram stopped by and urged the former president to tune into her Fox show that night at 10 o'clock. She said she would be talking about his former medical advisors. A few nights earlier, CNN had aired a documentary featuring critical comments by Burks, Fauci, and other members of Trump's coronavirus task force. We're really going to put it to the doctors. By golly, you should watch into my show. I don't know. She's an idiot. This is a weird way of speaking. That's not it, but okay. We're really going to put it to the doctors. You should watch, Ingram told Trump, dressed in classic Palm Beach attire of a bright striped blouse and sherbet-colored slacks, Ingram was one of the few women at the club that night wearing pants. The vast majority wore cocktail dresses and stiletto heels. Then, Kimberly Guilfoyle, the girlfriend of Trump's eldest son, paraded through with a full face of makeup. She told her small clutch of guests to go out on the patio to take their seats, and she would join them soon. Then she hovered nearby our interview to say hello to the former president. Keep giving your son money, I guess is what she was there to say. Guilfoyle's approach seemed cautious and formal, unlike someone greeting her boyfriend's father. She had recently bought a mansion with Donald Trump Jr. in nearby Jupiter, but she had other reasons to claim good standing in Trump's world. Guilfoyle had been a major fundraiser for Trump's campaign and promoted the claim that the election had been rigged. She asked Trump to please come by her dinner table later, where she would sit with Trump Jr. so she could introduce her friends to him. Just to encourage him to come visit his son, but okay. They are huge supporters of yours, Guilfoyle stressed. Trump nodded and smiled, telling her he would swing by. Congressman Dan Crenshaw, the Texas Republican and former Navy SEAL, also came by, interrupting the interview to tell Trump that life in Palm Beach was obviously agreeing with him. You look great, sir, Crenshaw said. What's your secret? Uh, I think I know the secret, Dan. Is it licking boots? Maybe that could be it. Maybe that's the secret. That's not... I'm going to tell him that. Of course, I don't lick boots, but I want him to continue licking boots. If I say it's licking boots... Then Crenshaw is going to lick some boots. The former Navy SEAL. Sir, you look great, sir. How do you do it? What's your secret? Aren't we, aren't we glad we trained him up as a Navy SEAL? So brave. As more dinner guests with plates began queuing up in the room to visit the raw bar and other food stations. God, I just have this in a McDonald's. Trump finally decided it was time to wrap up our conversation. 
He invited us to stay for dinner and instructed the maitre d' to find us a table. Make sure they get a good table. I'm the king of the Mar-a-Lago. Then the former president stepped onto the veranda and into the last of the day's sun. Right on cue, the dinner guests immediately stood up at their tables to applaud him. You can't even effing eat your dinner in peace there. $200,000 to be a member, but you got to stand and applaud whenever Bozo walks in. He took it all in, smiling. Just another Wednesday night at Mar-a-Lago. And off he went, table by table, to greet friends. Later in the evening, Trump returned to check on us. He wanted to make sure we were comfortable. His gallantry seemed genuine. And, of course, what he's going to do with this, by the way, is when you write your book and it comes out that you think he's an effing idiot, I was so good to them. They're very nasty people, very nasty people. I, I brought them here. You've seen the jumbo shrimp, the oysters, right, that we have? on seafood buffet night. I gave them anything they wanted. All the shrimp you could eat. Gave them the best table. Champagne, caviar, you name it. Did it make a difference? Not a not a bit. The bastards, they wrote the book, just ugh, unbelievable. No one's ever had worse press coverage. Like, no one's ever been treated before. Free lobster, free shrimp, free oysters. These are $100 a piece. Maybe a thousand, maybe a million dollars. They probably ate, I would say, no exaggeration, a million dollars worth of caviar while they were here. Not, a, couldn't find a good word to say about me. But, you know, what are you going to do? But that's okay. It's okay. There, that's the media. The lying media. There you go. So there you go. Good conversation, Trump said. I'm getting the word out. That's what his summation of their interview was. The interview, he said, was a great honor. He offered to do another if we needed to ask anything else and shrugged off the mention of how many hours we had already spent, or he had already spent, answering our questions. I enjoyed it, actually. That I actually believe. Trump said, a twinkle in his eye. For some sick reason, I enjoyed it. Is it because you enjoy sick things? That could actually be true. So there you go. How do you like that? That, uh, I don't know whether that appears in the book or whether that's background for the book or what. It does say, From I Alone Can Fix It by Carol Leonick and Philip Rucker. There you go. Uh, how's that for uh, a vacation day's sampling? Unbelievable. I could have wasted a whole show on this. Uh, but I got to do the old Trump impression. And uh, seemed like old times. In a, in a very, very very strongly bad way. From NetWordsRadio.com You have been listening to K-Grow in the Morning with David Waldman. Well, all right. Thank you very much for listening so very strongly. I really, truly appreciate it. Like no one has ever listened before. Perhaps if we keep this up, you may never listen again. But we hope to see you again on our next show, whether that's tomorrow or next week. Who knows? 